Okay, so Mariana, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. We're talking about uh, particularly the uh, uh, Waterfront Toronto Google project, and uh, uh, but also the role of technology, I guess, and how uh, particularly we govern the, the use of technology uh, mm -hmm. inside municipalities today. I thought I'd begin just by asking you just to say what you do here at the University of Toronto, just to introduce yourself for the students. Okay, so I teach legal studies, law and society kind of courses, and for the last 10 years or so, my main focus has been urban law and governance. So like, I'm an expert who's called upon to talk about city bylaws and why is it illegal to have a lemonade stand on the sidewalk and things like that. But this expertise in city bylaws now kind of is quite helpful when looking at something like a plan for a smart city, a plan that hasn't been thought of with any, any connection to existing city rules and policies and laws. Thank you. And so we're going to talk about, water, uh, about Waterfront Toronto. Uh, some of the people who are watching this won't be familiar with the project. Um, could you just, perhaps in a couple of sentences, tell them what's going on in Toronto with the sidewalk uh, development? Um, well, it, it's very important, I think, for people to understand that it is not the city of Toronto that is sitting down with Google or its affiliate, um, you know, called Sidewalk Labs. It's an entity called Waterfront Toronto, which is a public agency that was set up initially in the wake of a failed Olympic bid, <laughs> which is why there were three levels of government involved. Generally speaking, public agencies are hived off by just one level of government. So the transit agency of a city is usually a subsidiary uh, of the city as a corporation. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And then there's national parks that are federal. You know, there's all kinds of public agencies and public entities. And usually they're accountable to and created by only one level of government. But any Olympic bid requires all levels of government to go in on it. So, you know, Toronto put in a bid for the 2008 Olympics, which as some people might remember ended up in Beijing and not in Toronto. So, um, but the three levels of government had already gotten together to talk about how the Olympics could take place on the waterfront. So you already had these three levels of government involved in talking about the waterfront. So when the Olympics weren't going to happen there, then it was like, okay, so what are we going to do? And they decided to set up this tri-government agency, which is a very awkward structure, to redevelop the waterfront and bring, well, now, you know, mainly condos and some public parks and so on. Um, and over the years, the main thing that Waterfront Toronto did was remediate soil, clean it up, find developers that would build something. I mean, it's not all condos. There's a community college there. There's a university residence. There's a Y. Uh, and there's also some public spaces. So Waterfront Toronto sort of was responsible for doing all of this. But it's a total accident of history that the three levels of government are somehow all involved. And it's, I think you could say it's a case of too many masters, but nobody really minding the shop. So none of the governments seem to be really exercising much control over what happened in Waterfront Toronto or any real, um, or, you know, creating any real accountability. Okay. And um, so, You've expressed concerns about the governance of this project particularly. Um, so what are the current arrangements for, as far as you understand them, for making uh, decisions about this project? How, how are decisions going to get made? Um, well, 
The project was announced over a year ago, in October of 2017, and the announcement was very rushed. Um, somebody I know did an access to information request for federal government correspondence about the announcement and, you know, to some extent, the project. And clearly, the Prime Minister's office was pushing for this announcement to happen very quickly. The provincial government also wanted it done because Kathleen Wynne was already in trouble and, you know, this was going to be sort of something to make her look good. Um, so it was definitely rushed and two people that I and a colleague interviewed told us that the Prime Minister's office had conversations with Google, which would be totally unethical and would be a total breach of procurement policies and so on. Um, uh, but that seems likely because otherwise why the rush? Uh, to announce something when there wasn't anything to announce. So the original announcement just said, Sidewalk Labs is going to be working with Waterfront Toronto on this new smart city called Keyside. But there was no information, no nothing. Um, and the city of Toronto in particular was left out of all of the maneuvering. And we now have an audit of Waterfront Toronto by the Provincial Auditor General, which suggests that if it wasn't a sole source contract, well, it's not even a contract, a sole source agreement, um, it was pretty close to it because clearly Google and Sidewalk had more information than anybody else did. And also Waterfront Toronto has refused to say who the top three bidders were, generally speaking, the names of the final bidders are released when you have a big project. Um, you know, when you have architectural contests about who's going to be the architect for something, there's often even a public exhibition of the finalists and so on. Um, anyway, so it is clear that the process was rushed, was bad. There was probably political interference. Um, and the Waterfront Toronto Board had two days to consider, or three days, I think, to consider the proposal before they voted on it. So as a result, Julie DiLorenzo, who's a prominent developer, she's not like some left-wing whatever, she resigned from the Board of Waterfront Toronto because she said there's no way the board is doing its due diligence if they're being asked to sign on to something with no time to look at it. And then that original agreement was kept secret and they refused to reveal it. It turns out there wasn't really that much in it, but there were vague things that promised Sidewalk all kinds of goodies, uh, many of which Waterfront Toronto was in no position to offer to anyone because they don't have the power to do so. So that's the kind of history. And then after that, there were various public so-called consultations. I went to two out of the first three and they were just sort of dog and pony shows where Rit Agarwala flew in from New York City to tell us why it is that software engineers are the best people to be doing city planning, <laughs> which did not go over very well, um, even to an audience that had a lot of engineers and software people. Um, and Sidewalk did the consultations themselves instead of Waterfront Toronto doing them, which was extremely questionable. Um, and as I said, all these people were flying in from New York City. So at one of the consultations, I was there sort of around the hallway where they had all these poster displays of all their fancy gadgets that they want to have. And I was sort of walking around and there was one that seemed to be environmentally oriented. It was about the greenery and the actual water and so on. So I was looking at it and there was this guy with a Sidewalk Toronto t-shirt who was there, I think, to sort of explain it. And I said to him, oh, like, are you a planning student? Because a whole lot of planning students had been hired by the consulting company that ran the consultations. And he said, oh, no, I'm a software engineer. And I said, oh, and where do you live? He said, New York City. And I said, oh, so like, <laughs> 
what do you work on? He said, oh, I work on the Internet of Things. And so I said to him, oh, well, that's interesting. Tell me more about it. So I got my five-minute sort of tutorial on the Internet of Things. In the meantime, I'm thinking, why is a Google software engineer from New York helping with consultations for this project? And it was very clear that, you know, people were being flown in from New York. Then they started hiring and they said, oh, $50 million is going to be put into this project. Well, a lot of that money is going straight back into New York City because they're hiring. They've been hiring people, software engineers, per, uh, product designers, I don't know who else. The only people who are here who are being hired are the policy, PR, people, the sort of lower level jobs, their the housing advisor who has to be a local person and so on. But all of the good jobs with the $50 million are being created in New York City or some in San Francisco, I, I hear. So that's just part of the picture, but it sort of shows the hubris of these people who are probably very good at being software engineers, but who don't realize that city planning is its own expertise. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't think, oh, because I'm a software engineer, I can do brain surgery. But they think they can do city planning because they imagine city planning is some, something that anybody can do. And that is not the case. They also were totally ignorant about the fact that because the site is within the city of Toronto, not only do zoning and other laws apply, but also the City of Toronto's procurement policy applies. And the city's procurement policy is very careful about no sole sourcing and treating all, all potential vendors equally and so on. Um, so the city being marginalized and both sidewalk and waterfront Toronto ignoring the the power that the city has got them into trouble. And now they're trying to walk a lot of things back. The latest consultation was led by Waterfront Toronto, and they just had a sidewalk person speaking at it or whatever. But they could see that there was a problem with sidewalk coming from New York and doing their dog and pony show for the locals. Um, so, I mean, this is a relationship between waterfront, I guess, to some degree, the city of Toronto, and this big company, one of the biggest ever companies, Google. Um, what does this uh, you know, mean in terms of community uh, involvement and control? You mentioned they were doing the consultations. Yeah. But, I mean, but there does seem, this seems to bring a new element into, uh, you know, involvement in community planning and involvement in this project particularly. Yeah, and here Waterfront Toronto is as much at, at fault as anybody else because they've often had community consultations. That means whoever feels like showing up shows up. And so that tends to be the well-educated creative classes who either live at the waterfront or might work there or might feel empowered to come and give their opinions about how waterfront development should happen. Uh, I mean, I've studied community consultations, and in Toronto, and I think in other places too, they're dominated by what I call the retired school teacher demographic. There's these people who love to go to community consultations. They have the time, they have the literacy, they're able to speak, you know, stand up in public and say something, but they're not representative of the city of Toronto. So tenants, new immigrants, youth, are not represented because they don't tend to show up if you just say, oh, I'm having this consultation about some park on the waterfront. Um, so what some of us are now arguing is that if you're going to have a little dog park in your neighborhood, it's fine to just consult the neighbors who live on that street. But this project is way, is way different. It should be managed at a different scale and participation should be at a different scale. It can't just be the people who already live in the condos by the lake who are considered the stakeholders. It has to be the city as a whole. 
because if we had a different process, a more inclusive democratic process, more emphasis on affordable housing and perhaps blue collar jobs, then a lot of people would live down in Keyside who so far are stuck in the outer outer reaches of Scarborough living in, you know, whatever, you know, post war high rises. So we're arguing that it's no good for Waterfront Toronto to consult with their own little pet group that they already have of citizens called Waterfront for All. That group is totally bought into the Waterfront Toronto idea and many of them live around there. Um, and so we're arguing, well, it's not that they shouldn't be, you know, consulted, but they're not the voice of the citizenry. And this is too important and it's too big a site. And no one lives on the actual site. So the whole of the city should be involved. And indeed, I would argue that it's even more than the city of Toronto, that the whole of Canada should be paying attention to this. Uh, the federal government now has this Smart Cities Challenge, um, which has identified, I think, 25 or so top contenders. I don't know if the funding is going through with this Smart Cities Challenge, but you know, whatever happens with the much smaller amounts of money and much, you know, the much smaller scale of what will probably be the other Smart Cities Challenge. Um, you know, whatever happens here is relevant to that. Um, uh, and one of the other things that a lot of people have been arguing, including me, arguing for is that we should split up, disaggregate the Smart City and say, you know what, there are technical improvements that might make traffic flow better. But the city already has a system for monitoring traffic flow and a system that can change you know, how street lights go. And maybe the idea would be to support the city's improving the system they already have. And you know, traffic management is one thing, and it's run by one entity. That should be completely separate from gathering data about people's location from their cell phones as they walk through there. Um, you know, so disaggregating the different elements would be a good idea, and then the citizens or their elected representatives can decide well, which gadgets and which technical improvements do we really want. And who should own and control the gadgets or the data? Is there, does the fact that we're, de we're living in an age of rapid technological change, that things are you know, happening very quickly, new innovations are appearing, uh, does this mean that the structures that we have uh, for municipal governance, for national governance, are in some way uh, less suited or struggling to deal with the challenges of organizations like Google. You know, is there a better way to do this mm -hmm. that, that perhaps, you know, calls into question the ways that, that we have established for doing these things so far? That might be part of the argument that Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk might use for the way they've done things so far that basically our existing structures aren't good enough? Is, is there a better way for us to do it? Oh, well, you know, there's always ways of improving things, and certainly the City of Toronto's planning process, it's very cumbersome, and there could be a lot of improvements made to it. But a lot of the improvements have nothing to do with better technology, because a lot of the red tape and bureaucracy that now has anybody who wants to open a small business have to go to City Hall 17 different times, and this is an actual figure, this is not me exaggerating, that, to talk to 17 different people to get 17 different permits. Well, that could be expedited and you don't need a lot of fancy digital anything. So I mean, a lot of what needs to be improved are governance processes that may use technology, but sometimes the improvements could be made by other means, sort of more old-fashioned political and bureaucratic reform means. The other point that I think is really worth considering for a class that 
has to do with the social impact of, of technology is the fact that cities have been coping with technological change since the days of the Roman Empire, when the Romans invented sewers. Now, that was a big technological change. And I'm sure somebody had to figure out who was going to pay for them and where they were going to go and figure out all kinds of issues. Um, I had a PhD student years ago who did, in the kind of relatively early days of the web, did a nice thesis on governance on the internet. And he had an initial chapter that went into great de detail about the invention of the telephone and how when t the telephone was invented, it completely revolutionized communications and it created all of these fears and these risks. So, for instance, people were really afraid that strangers were going to be phoning their house and talking to their 10-year-old daughter. You know, so the same fears people now have about the internet, a lot of people had about the telephone. Because what is this, that anybody could call your house and speak to your daughter or your servant or whatever? It caused all these fears. And uh, telephone regulation was a long and complex and interesting process. Uh, electricity. Again, when cities started to be electrified, that was a huge, huge change. Um, and a lot of, you know, there was a lot of difference in how that was responded to. In some places, utilities like electricity were publicly owned. In other places, they were private. Um, but choices had to be made. So things like the telephone, electricity, um, the car, like, you know, when cars started to uh, be sort of a common object in cities, it was one thing and there was hardly any, but when all of a sudden, you know, um, a motor vehicle was a normal thing. Well, it was totally chaotic. And a friend of mine did some research on the history of traffic laws, and it's quite fascinating how cities had to suddenly develop, and other jurisdictions, like in Canada, uh, you know, provinces had to develop all these governance mechanisms to govern traffic. Because if you only have 10 cars in the city, you don't need traffic rules. But if you have 1,000, then you do. Things like speed limits, somebody had to figure out. So cities and other, you know, public entities have been coping with technological change for a long time. And they've been developing rules and trying to set limits that serve the public interest and, you know, a lot of bad sort of decisions were taken too in terms of governance. But, you know, the way traffic is regulated today, we take it for granted. But somebody had to invent that. And so if now we're thinking, maybe we should regulate these, you know, Silicon Valley giants, that's not actually as new a concept as people might think because traffic is regulated, utilities are regulated, um, you know, advertising is regulated, so that governments should regulate how privately owned assets are used and how private companies should, you know, proceed is not at all new. It's just that some people in San Francisco or New York seem to imagine when they did things like invent Uber that they could just do whatever they wanted and pay no attention to existing laws. And then, of course, we got the problems that we got. Um, so the regulation of technology is an old subject. It's not new. OK, and as far as this project is concerned, uh, one of the questions around it is uh, how the data that might be generated by it uh, how it might be, uh, first of all, uh, managed as far as the privacy of the people who it's being mm -hmm. collected about is concerned. And then secondly, who might own that data and benefit from it financially, intellectually, and mm -hmm. presumably in other ways. So, uh, you know, could you talk about 
uh, your views on that? Um, yeah, I don't know enough about data and intellectual property law to have a very good opinion about this, but I can report that now Sidewalk is saying that the data will be put in a data trust, which sounds good because it makes it seem like there's a sort of public interest there. A trust, after all, is an asset that is run for the benefit of somebody who's not the owner of the asset. That's what a, a trust is in law. Um, but there's sort of two real problems surrounding that, which a lot of people are starting to talk about. One is that before you can make any asset into a trust, you have to own it. And it's not clear to me why Sidewalk thinks they're going to own the data such that then benevolently they'll put it in a data trust that's supposed to be administered for the benefit of you know the people of Toronto. So if you don't own the asset, you can't uh, you know put it into a trust. Just like I can't create a trust for my children unless I have the whatever million dollars to put into the trust, right? Um, or a charitable trust. Somebody has to have the money to then turn that asset into Somebody a trust. has to own it to exactly. be able to put it so into the trust. So it would itself. seem to presuppose ownership. And Waterfront Toronto has not been at all assertive about saying the data should be publicly owned. Uh, Jim Balsilli, for example, is of the view that all data collected in public spaces should be publicly owned. Well, I think that's a very reasonable proposal. And, you know, he can't be accused of being some, you know, socialist. Uh, so if he thinks that, well, that's interesting. And a trust is not the same thing as public ownership. So there's a lot of problems there that there's a lot of fuzziness around around the whole thing. Um, and then the other point that I've been talking about with people who know more about data and trust is that right now we have an awful lot of data sets that are publicly owned, like the census data, for instance. But that doesn't mean that the public is necessarily going to really benefit from the way that data, you know, from all the resources we put into collecting the census data and, you know, sort of turning it into readable form or whatever they do at Statistics Canada, presumably they clean up the data and um, organize it in some way. So that's all, um, you know, public money that went into it. And supposedly the Canadian public owns Statistics Canada data. But who is in a position to use it? Well, it's the marketing companies that can go to t Statistics Canada and pay for special runs because now you have to pay if you want Statistics Canada to churn out numbers for you. It used to be they would do it. Um, a lot of my colleagues who work with crime data are totally frustrated because now it's incredibly difficult to get data in usable form from Statistics Canada um, because they haven't completely privatized it, but they've sort of marketized their services. So if you want any kind of special run that's going to generate the data you want, um, even if you're going to do all the work of analyzing it, you have to pay them. Um, you know, in line with the kind of neoliberal thing about having people pay for government services that used to be free, like tuition for example. So um, uh, even if data is owned by the public or by some public entity, it doesn't mean that private companies like Google that have endless resources and capacity to use it and monetize it and you know turn it into whatever, some kind of marketable commodity, wouldn't be the ones to really benefit. So in theory, some community group can use Statistics Canada data. But in practice, how are they going to do it? Um, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the computer power. They don't have the servers. They don't have the clouds. Google has all those things. So even if data is publicly owned, it doesn't at all solve the problem of who's going to benefit 
and who's going to, um, what questions are even going to be answered. It's not just a matter of who's going to make the money. It's a matter of what questions will be answered. And the questions that will be answered with questions like, is it likely that people who take streetcars are likely to go to Starbucks coffee shops or buy condos? Well, that's a question that is very useful if you're a condo developer and you want to know that a good place to put a new condo is you know, near a subway or near a streetcar or something, right? A community group or a tenants group or an immigrant group has different questions. And how are those answers, how are answers to those questions going to be produced, even if the data are publicly owned? And presumably you're suggesting that decisions over the data that would be collected, uh, what would be done with the data, what would be acceptable to use the data for, which questions could be asked. And that type of thing would be the response would be political uh, decisions by politicians at some level, uh, of course democratically elected and everything else, but that this would be uh, something that would become a political responsibility. Um, is that basically what you're suggesting? Um, well, I'm not sure whether that's the best way to go. Um, or whether there should be more like a sort of committee of experts, because quite frankly, on issues like what should be done with data, I would trust my colleague at the law school, Lisa Austin, who's the expert on privacy. I would trust her a lot more than I trust any government bureaucrat okay. who might well be swayed by that government's relationships with Google or other companies. So. I don't know, but what I know is that there is a prior question about who is allowed to collect data, especially in public spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how is that turned into an asset? Um, I read a really interesting paper that your students might be interested in, done for the CG Institute by Teresa Scassa, who's a real expert on data. And she explains that data, just raw data, can't be owned. Facts are in the public domain. That is the principle number one of intellectual property law in every country. Facts cannot be owned. So if the data is just the fact that I was walking down a particular street, which is a fact recorded on my phone, that fact itself can't be owned. You have to process it somehow or put it together with other things, or claim that you have some special gadget that collects the data or something, and then you can own that. So you can own the means by which you collect data, or you can own the processing. You know, if you turn the data into some fancy graph, you can then have copyright on that graph. But data itself can't actually, like raw data, kind of that basic primary data about where I had lunch today, which is visible in my phone, um, or to anybody who can access my phone, that actually can't be owned because facts are in the public domain. And I think a lot of the people who are talking about data assume that data, all data, including the most basic level data, is an asset. And it's either owned by the individual about whom that data speaks, or by a corporation. So you fight it out. Oh no, I own my data. Oh no, the corporation owns it. Well, that facts are in the public domain, I think, is a really important point. And it's really worth pondering then, what are they talking about when they talk about data ownership? And maybe they don't mean that. Maybe what they mean is the means by which they collect it or how they aggregate it. And they, you know, if you have an algorithm that's proprietary, then you own the algorithm. But you don't own the data that is used by that algorithm. Um, uh, I mean, you might if it's already been processed, but not raw facts about you know, people's lives. But presumably, people's concern from a privacy point of view uh, is whether someone's allowed to collect that and then 
I guess in what you're saying, the manipulation of that would be something yeah. that would be owned and controlled, mm -hmm. but the actual collection of it might not be, is that? Yeah, um, uh, I mean, one of the questions that has come up only recently, I don't know why, is the fact that people are saying, well, if you had some little tech, you know, company from Waterloo that was collecting data from sensors on the waterfront and, you know, doing something with it, well, that might be questionable if it's, if they're, they're not following privacy laws or if they're selling it for, you know, nefarious purposes, whatever. But you wouldn't be nearly as worried about them doing it as you would about Google. Why? Because Google already has tons of data about all of us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is individual data. So Google somewhere has a record of what, you know, pages I visited on websites. Um, well, the local tech firm in Waterloo wouldn't know that about me. Mm -hmm. So any local tech firm that was allowed to collect data would pose a much lower risk of anything nefarious happening because they don't have all of the other data sets that can be linked to it. So presumably, you know, what this is saying is that there's very little harm or reason for individuals to be concerned about collection of public behavior, uh, uh, you know, information about their public behavior. You know, did I get on this bus or did I, um, you know, walk down this street? Did I go into this shop? Collecting that information is, isn't something we should be too concerned well, about. Well, yeah. I'm but it's what's done with it. It's what's done is, with it, exactly. It is our concern. Because if the public transit company is recording how many people get on the Queen Streetcar, which is the one I have to take, I don't mind them, you know, recording that information because they're going to use it to improve Queen Streetcar service, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if a Google company is collecting it, then what is it for? Mm -hmm. um, and Sidewalk actually has already been in serious breach of, of provincial privacy laws because they set up a little project to collect data in a public space in Thorncliffe Park mm -hmm. in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And they talked to some little community group, a group of mainly immigrant women who are trying to do interesting things with the park. And these immigrant women probably didn't know who Sidewalk was or didn't appreciate the risks. So they allowed Sidewalk to put cameras in the park to record who was in what part of the park when. Uh, I mean, probably not individuals. It was probably what spaces were being used at various times. I mean, I mean it would be an even bigger scandal than it already is if they were actually recording individual data. But even if it was an individual, even if it was the kind of mapping of who's where and, you know, which spaces are busy or not not busy, even that is problematic if it's sidewalk that's doing it, because what are they doing it for? They're not a community agency, they're not a charity, and they're not the public transit system, which I do believe if they collect information, I mean, things could go wrong or they could be hacked or something. But at least the purpose for which the entity was created was to provide public transit. So if they collect data to improve the transit, I'm not going to complain too much about it. Um, you know, because in the end, we're all constantly providing data to whether it's the city or, you know, private corporations. And I think, you know, the horse bolted a long time ago on that. Um, we're not going to stop that. And what we have to start paying a lot more attention to is who gives permission and who controls the process and what is their agenda. And so Sidewalk's agenda is to make money. It's a for-profit corporation and fine for them. That's what those corporations are for. It's not to serve the interests of the people of Toronto. Um, that doesn't mean they're nefarious but it just means their interests are completely divergent with the interests of, of 
of the locals. And so all of these questions that are coming up are, I think, really useful because they're not just about Sidewalk or Google. They're questions about how citizens participate in their own governance. Uh, you know, when are we consulted? When are we not consulted? When do we get to draw the line? When do we decide, you know, collectively or individually that information is going to be collected? And I mean, these issues of information collection are, again, are not new. Um, I mean, I grew up in a fascist dictatorship, essentially, in Spain. Well, information was being collected there for the purpose of, you know, political surveillance. And okay, they didn't have the internet, they didn't even have computers. They had, you know, spies who went around and sat in, you know, professors' classrooms to write notes on what the professors were saying. So they had old-fashioned methods of collecting information. But there's always been a politics to information collection. I think the fact that it's being collected via cell phones doesn't really alter the basic problem. It it just increases the, you know, what's at stake because so much more information can be cheaply collected. After all, not too many states could send around spies to every single coffee shop and classroom in the country. Uh, so now we have information being collected at a much larger scale. But the basic issues of the politics of information are just as old as the issues about the governance of technology. And so what you basically seem to be seem to be saying, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that it wouldn't be the case that Sidewalk wouldn't be allowed to do anything with data, but that there would be some things that were acceptable and some things that weren't, and that there would need to be transparency ab about what they might do. So, so they may, it may be acceptable for them to uh, take the information that they have on people's behavior within the sidewalk community um, and use that to improve transport or, or something like that, but it might not be acceptable for them to share that information with a marketing company who would use that to sell something to you when you're most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think a lot of these decisions are going to be taken out of the hands of both waterfront and sidewalk because the province is working on a digital strategy that includes sort of data, you know, the politics of data. I don't know much about that, but I know they're working on one. The city of Toronto already has a policy, and I don't exactly know what it says, but it would apply there. So you don't have to have a special policy for every new project or neighborhood. You know, just like if you go and buy a new cell phone, you shouldn't have to have, you know, completely new policies that apply to that. Um, there should be, and I think in many jurisdictions, you're beginning to get general rules that are just the law of the land. And so you don't need to start from scratch with all these things. And I mean, Sidewalk often talks as if, oh, it's up to them to benevolently decide that they will share data with some non-profit or something. Well, you know, sorry, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't want charity. What we want is proper, uh, you know, proper rules. Um, you know, so as I'm sure you know, in Europe, there's a data law yep. that's fairly GDPR, strict. Yeah. Yes, you know, it's fairly strict. I don't know the details. I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but um, it's a general law. Mm -hmm. And because I um, get emails from publications and universities and other places in Europe, I've been getting all these emails saying, well, now we have to be compliant with this policy. So now you have to personally confirm that you want to get emails from us or, you know, things like that. So if that's happening, it's going to happen in Ontario sooner or later. And that would then mean that there are policies that apply all over. So if somebody wants to have some project with new sensors to collect some kind of data in Waterloo or in Niagara Falls, 
they're subject to the same rules and everybody knows what the rules are and everybody is, is on a level playing field. And that's what makes sense to me is to have general rules and laws rather than say, well, for this project, we're going to set up some little, you know, trust that's going to decide, you know, how to use the data. Well, I don't think that makes sense. But presumably what this also implies uh, is that it would be possible to, to have a community exist uh, with the involvement of a company like Google in some way um, that might come close or perhaps actually achieve the objectives that there are for it, of a smart community mm -hmm. with all these uh, innovative things taking place inside it. It's oh, not yeah. beyond the bounds of possibility that this could yeah. be created. Well, and so those of us who've been agitating against this particular way of going about things, what we keep saying is that we're not against technology. In fact, some of the people, like my new friend Bianca Wiley, who I didn't know before all of this, um, we keep saying we're not against technology and we're not even against data being collected. It is being collected after all. Um, we just um think that public entities should set the agenda and decide what they want and so then they get a vendor and the vendor can say oh there's this gadget but also we could invent this other thing or we're working on this other prototype and maybe this could be done better and then the public entity would be happy to see that just like if the city has a contract out for garbage removal if somebody comes along who has a much better garbage truck, well, the city will be very happy. <laughs> so, you know, cities are not against innovation, and the citizens who are agitating around this project are certainly not against technology or innovation. In fact, many of the people are themselves, um, you know, tech people. Um, uh, so it's not a question of being a Luddite and saying, oh, down with technology, I want to go back to pen and paper. Um, it's a question of saying, well, the tail shouldn't be wagging the dog. And so the company that's offering services shouldn't be the one that's deciding what services we should have, which is the stuff that they serves their interest because they think they can then sell it all over the world or something. We should decide what we want. That's why I think we should disaggregate all of the different elements of this smart city proposal and then say, well, okay, we want this. And not just we, but specifically the transit company wants this, and the waste management department wants this, and, you know, whatever, the planning department wants this kind of data. I mean, the planning department suffers from lack of good data, I happen to know, and I'm sure they'd be happy if somebody had a way of giving them much better data on what is being built and how. Um, because they can tell you what the zoning map is, but they can't give you a map of what actually is built. Because there's so many exceptions, and they don't really keep track of those exceptions, they don't really map them anyway. So it would be good for the planning department to have a map of the city that was much more accurate. Now, if Google Earth is going to do that, then they have a contract with the planning department that's going to be fairly clear about what the data is going to look like and what it's going to be used for and who's going to have it and so on. And, and it would seem very sensible to suggest that if all of these wonderful things are going to happen in the Quayside development, that we should be considering at the outset how those might be integrated, uh, how those might complement, be suited to in the future, the general infrastructure and services in the rest of the city, you know, how they'll integrate, as you're mm -hmm. saying, with our existing transport systems and other things that we use inside the city. I mean, that would, uh, looking at how this development can benefit the wider city would seem to be a good thing. Sure, um, but I think it would be much better if a different company were the partner because you know, a company that is based at least in Ontario, if not in Toronto, would have a much better chance of being in sync with the interests and needs of the municipality. Um, 
And so a company that's based in New York and is global and is flying around all over the world, you know, trying out things, is not the best partner for something like this. I mean, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have anything to offer, but as I said, I think we should disaggregate all these things and say, well, if we wanted these weird wooden buildings that are cheaper to build or something, well, we don't get that from Google. We get it from a construction company. Uh, like, that's who you get it from. Um, and I'm surprised that there's not more outcry from the local tech community about the way in which Google was brought in and seems to be taking up all the space um, because I'm sure there's a lot of um, local companies that could be offering all kinds of solutions to information problems and other kinds of problems like traffic management or whatever, uh, but they haven't had the chance. The tech sector uh, like to call the period we're going through politically with technology, uh, they call the tech clash at the moment. There's yeah. been a, you know, a reaction, a, a skepticism, a growing skepticism about the role of technology in society. Do you think that's contributed to how people are viewing the project uh, in Keysight? Oh, yes, for sure, because precisely because Google is uh, the, the so-called partner here, although the sidewalk people always say, we're not Google, we're a sister company of Google. But of course, that's nonsense. Google is the entity you're Google, really Google. dealing with. Um, and so because there's been all of these scandals about how Google's been you know, collecting all kinds of information, even after people turned off the location thing on their phone or whatever, right? So all of these scandals about things happening that shouldn't have been happening, breaches of the law, breaches of privacy, data being sold in ways that it shouldn't have been sold, it's definitely adding to the skepticism. Um, and as I said, I think the challenge now is maybe for locally based companies to say, hey, we can do the same sort of thing, or at least some of the components of the project, but we don't have that history and we don't have the incredible ego that these engineers in New York seem to have. And so I think that there's a great opportunity for more, you know, Canadian based and more locally rooted, um, you know, companies, whether they be in the data business or in some other business, like producing better traffic lights or something. Um, I mean, I think there's a great opportunity now because a lot of people are saying, well, the problem is Google. The problem isn't the idea of using technology to improve, um, you know, urban life. Although everything that is in those drawings that Sidewalk Labs put out, all of those things already exist somewhere. So it's not like, oh, we're going to invent all these new things. All of them exist. I mean, I don't know for a fact, but you know, people who do know said, oh yeah, that automated underground garbage removal, that exists, you know, somewhere. Um, and in fact, it couldn't actually exist on the waterfront because the water table is so high, it goes up to about, you know, three, four feet below ground. So you can't have... Maybe um, there'll be submarines. You know, basements and you can't have underground, not to mention the fact that it's a breach of the collective agreement between the unionized waste management workers in the city, like the kinds of things that haven't been thought through and they, you know, you can't expect sidewalk in New York to think about these things, but you would expect Waterfront Toronto to know that they can't promise anything in terms of transit or garbage removal or whatever, because that's not their, it's not their jurisdiction. I wanted to touch on just one other thing. We've covered most of the things. Uh, I think I had on my list, and you know you can add any you wish. Um, but the thing I wanted to touch on was the idea that this development will create its own intellectual property. There's going to be knowledge gained from it about uh, how to do this sort of thing elsewhere. 
and, uh, and presumably other things too. And ownership of that is something that's been discussed. So uh, what are your feelings about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I've looked into this because the current agreement, the one that is not secret, the one that was signed on July 31st, says, literally, Waterfront Toronto will have the opportunity to share in the profits. And I think, oh yeah, right. Like, if I sign an agreement with my bank and it says I'll have the opportunity to share in their profits, I'm really going to sort of take that not very you know seriously so um i don't think sidewalk has any intention of sharing the profits from the ip uh or just sharing the ownership of the ip which is a separate question and in fact sidewalk has issued rfps uh whereby they are asking for designers and things like that and in those calls for proposals, they specifically say this will be work for hire and we will own the IP and where it is not possible for us to own the IP, we will have a royalty free worldwide license. They actually say that somebody who works for The Logic, the magazine that does all of the really good tech reporting, mm -hmm. dug up these, um, these calls for proposals, and so clearly Sidewalk wants work for hire. Well, that's what they always do. That's what Google does. Um, they go to Waterloo and they hire people who've already worked at other companies and have smarts, expertise, ideas, and by hiring those people, they buy the IP that's in people's heads, mm -hmm. and I think they aren't going to behave any differently here, but this is where there needs to be a public partner that says, okay, you keep saying you're gonna use this community as the test bed for new IP. Well, we wanna be benefiting from that and we wanna own the IP. I mean, any public-private partnership, there should be a split of revenues and profits. That's why you go into a partnership. You don't go into a partnership to give away the shop. So that's a really serious problem that um, you know, I mean, in a way, somewhat premature to talk about it because who knows what IP will be happening. But there should be a principle by which the IP will be governed. Yes, that seems very sensible. Those are all my questions. Okay. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add, Mariana? Um, I guess the only thing I'd add is, as somebody who... Uh, uh, sort of uses the computer primarily as a typewriter <laughs> and also to read news online. So I use it as a combination of newspapers and, you know, typewriter. Um, it's been really interesting for me to get to know some of the younger folk who are alternative tech people um, uh, who run things like the Digital Justice Lab. Um, so I'm finding it really interesting that there are people who are tech people, and that's their background. Um, they're in computer science or engineering or whatever, but who are keenly concerned about social injustice, and they're trying to work with tech in ways that make for a more just society rather than contributing to what we see with Google, which is you know, billions and billions going to millionaires or billionaires in San Francisco and the rest of the world just being essentially um, lab rats that aren't being even fed by Google. <laughs> so, so it's been really interesting to get to know these young people who are working on tech issues as tech people. Well, I think what you've had to say, Mariana, is going to help uh a lot of tech people who are likely to watch this video uh, to understand maybe a bit better some of the questions that there are about the the things that they might be doing so sure thank you very much for for talking to me okay